Welcome on this glorious day. I know we saw a few sprinkles, but I have been promised that those were transitory. It's just going to be sunny and lovely. Um, welcome to this glorious day where we get to celebrate the class of 2024. My name is Ashish Jha, I'm the Dean of the School here at Brown School of Public Health. And I am very excited about today because we get to celebrate you, the class of 2024, but we're actually also celebrating another group of people. Are there any parents of graduates in the crowd? All right, I see a few hands. How about any grandparents of graduates? Yes, grandparents. How about siblings who are willing to admit they are siblings of graduates? All right. That's more than I was expecting. A lot of times, my sibling never wanted to acknowledge. Anyway, we're going to not talk about my family issues. Any spouses or partners of people graduating from this year's class? Excellent. Any other family members, aunts, uncles, cousins? And then how about the family we acquire along the way? Friends, any friends here? You know, we celebrate the graduates, but for all of you parents and grandparents and siblings and friends and spouses, you also get to do the hard work of supporting the graduates through what has been difficult, difficult here. So I wanna make sure we get a chance to celebrate all of you. So big round of applause to our family and friends. All right, now, graduating, you're not gonna, you wouldn't be graduating if you weren't learning things. In order to learn things, you need a faculty, and we have an extraordinary faculty at the Brown School of Public Health. So I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the faculty of the Brown School of Public Health. And then there's a group that actually makes everything happen. They don't, they get almost none of the attention, none of the praise, but they are the staff who, who make it look like magic, including this extraordinary event. So a round of applause for the staff who put this whole thing together. All right, now I was told, I don't see uh, Congressman Amo, Gabe Amo, I don't know if, if he's here, he was gonna be arriving. Traffic's a little bit bad out there, so I'm guessing, but he will be joining us. He's our congressperson from this district, Gabe, I got to know him when he was at the White House. Uh, he's an extraordinary leader, deeply committed to public health. And so when we see him, we'll, we'll say hello. And I'm also super excited today that we are joined uh, by a trustee of the university, Joelle Murchison. Joelle, thank you so much for being here. All right, now every class is special. Everybody stands up and says, you are a special class. I'm gonna make the case that you guys really are a special class. So let me make my case. The, those of you who are graduating as undergrads, you probably didn't have much of a high school commencement. It was probably canceled because of COVID. And so you came into college, you came to Brown in the middle of the pandemic, having missed the, the final phases of your senior year, and you decided that you are gonna take on public health as your undergraduate concentration. That makes you different than most classes who have gone through this. The master's students, you signed up in the middle of the, of the greatest public health crisis we've had and said, I wanna be a part of the solution to this crisis. This crisis that has both killed millions of people, has divided our country and the world. You said, I wanna learn the skills that are necessary to deal with crises like these and others I want to make public health stronger. And for the PhD students, some of you, many of you arrived before pandemic, uh, before COVID arrived, but your time here was disrupted, your time here had to change, and you showed resilience, and you have done extraordinary work. So really, all those who are graduating today, the undergrads, the masters, the PhD students, you really have had a very distinct experience, and you have shown your resilience your ability to continue to work under adversity, and I am grateful, and that will make you better prepared for the future. Okay. 
Okay, so you all know we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. This is the 10th anniversary class. Now, some people say, well, that's not very long. Well, that's how long our school has been an independent school, but public health at Brown has a 150-year history. Brown alum Charles Chapin, class of 76, that would be the class of 1876, was the provident superintendent of health during the 1918 flu pandemic. And he tracked cases as an epidemiologist does. And he gave out advice about how to protect yourself in the middle of the pandemic. And he helped ensure that Providence did much better than most American cities in terms of preventing illness, preventing deaths. That is what good brown education is supposed to do. It's supposed to teach you stuff. It's supposed to help you manage complex moments. In 1972, we'd formed a, a um, Department of Community Medicine, Department of Community Health at the medical school. And it was the first formal acknowledgement that individual health and community health are intrinsically tied. That communities are made up of individuals and we have to care about individuals, but individuals live in communities and if you don't understand the broader context in which people live, you can't just through the interaction in a clinic or in a hospital really address all the health issues that people have. 30 years ago, the Brown Corporation formally announced the development of an undergraduate concentration in public health and a master's of public health. So the history of public health at Brown may seem like a 10-year history. It's actually a very long and rich history. And what I'm excited about is all of you get to write the next chapter. Who is going to be the next Charles Chapman who has to manage another health crisis? We will have more health crises. You know, managing health crises are, is hard. You need to know stuff. Well, you guys have all learned stuff over the last two, three, four years. You also need to be driven by values. And those values are about protecting health, seeing the whole person, not just the disease, and understanding the community and the context in which, it, uh, which people live. All right, so I'm gonna finish up by a few key points I wanna just make. First of all, the biggest point of the day. Congratulations, this is very exciting, and you all should feel very, very proud at this moment. Second point is I am confident you are all gonna go out and do great work. And third is really just a plea, which is please keep in touch. Like, you're gonna go out there, you're gonna figure out how the world works, teach us about it. Circle back to us, tell us what we can be doing better. Because in that spirit of learning, we're all gonna get better doing public health. All right, let me introduce you next to a faculty member of, our, a member of ours. Many of you know Professor Wilmot James. Some of you may not. He is a professor in health services policy and practice. Um, Wilmot is a giant in public health and so much more. He has a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He was a professor at the University of Cape Town. He was on the first electoral commission after democracy after apartheid during the launch of democracy in South Africa. He has been a leader um, both in the public uh, space, but also intellectually on thinking about issues of pandemics and biosecurity. We are extraordinarily lucky to have Wilmot as our faculty member here. And I'm gonna ask him to introduce our keynote speaker. So Professor James. So thank you very much to Dean Ashish Jha, and of course, congratulations to our graduates here today. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce this year's keynote speaker, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut. Congresswoman DeLauro is a lifelong champion of paid and family leave, paid sick leave, and improving women's health care. She has a very deep understanding of how addressing the social determinants of health, such as poverty, can have a transformative effect for communities. For example, in 2021, 
as chair of the House Appropriations Committee, and she is the second woman to chair that committee in the history uh, of the US. Congresswoman DeLauro was instrumental in the passage of the monthly expanded and improved child tax credit. My friends, this expansion, which reached millions of families, reduced child poverty by almost half in one year. And indeed to the lowest recorded levels in history. That, of course, is a monumental achievement which should be sustained and she continues to lead the fight to make the expanded credit permanent. Congresswoman Dolaro has been an outspoken advocate for research and expanded access uh, to care, particularly for women, working families, and underserved communities. And through her work in federal subcommittees, Congresswoman Dolaro prioritize critical investments to support the strengthening of core public health institutions and capabilities at the Center for Disease Control, including increased funding for uh, CDC laboratories, public health data modernization, and investments in our public health workforce. So I've known Rosa for 42 years, and as a lifelong friend and colleague know well, how her qualities of personality, her devotion to improve people's lives, and her courageous leadership make the world a better place. I introduce her to you in great admiration of her professional achievements accomplished with a healthy dose of in Italian-inspired style. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Rosa Dolaro. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me just uh, express and echo um, Dr. Shah's words to, to parents, to grandparents, to siblings, to friends. Um, uh, just to say, you've, you've really, what your job was is to create this space for these young men and women to be able to thrive and to succeed. And for that, we all owe you a debt of gratitude. Thank you very, very much. Well, good afternoon, and yes, congratulations. Um, and I'm, I, I'm really so excited to be here today, uh, to be with you. You are all about to embark on this incredible adventure that is the rest of your lives. And I am honored to be here at the start of it. First, I must thank my lifelong friend, 42 years, Dr. Wilma James, for that introduction. He and his family are my inspiration on this stage today. He and his family earned their steel in the resistance to the apartheid regime. Prison is a great educator. My husband, Stan Greenberg, met him first as a student and then as a fellow at Yale's Southern African Research Program. He then created an organization in civil society welcomed by President Nelson Mandela to advise on the constitutional issues and to hold government accountable. That eventually meant running for office in the opposition, and he became the shadow health minister as HIV AIDS began devastating South Africa. He became a full professor, pushed through research on the genome Zika virus and Ebola, while bringing Mandela's writing and black power author Professor Charles Hamilton to larger audiences. When the pandemic hit, Wilmot immediately joined the battle on so many fronts globally. And rather than uniting COVID-19 divided countries, increased inequality, and raised 
distrust of government. This pandemic revealed huge gaps in vaccine take-up and delivery. Well, Wilmot was deeply schooled in divided societies and how you get past all those barriers to work together to serve community. So I am honored to be here with him. I also want to recognize the dean of this school, Dr. Rajesh Jha, for this invitation. I was the ranking leader of the House Health Appropriations Committee, and I watched the erratic White House response and very different responses of each governor. And then I watched Dr. Jha's commentary, and I said, why isn't he in charge? Why isn't he in charge? I called him regularly to consult on the best course for this nation to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic that killed so many. He was thankfully selected as the Biden administration's COVID response coordinator, directing the federal government's action, increasing the development of and access to treatments and newly formulated vaccines, dramatically improving testing and surveillance, and putting in place an infrastructure able to respond to current and future disease outbreaks more effectively. Dr. Jha managed to do this in a polarized country where he spoke with respect to all sides and advanced public health. And as he came back to Brown, there are no t-shirts with his face being sold online, but that is the measure of our times. And I am glad to see that he is now using his extraordinary leadership to lead the Brown School of Public Health with a commitment to positive, innovative impact on the most urgent public health crises that we face here and around the globe. I too want to acknowledge the very special faculty on the stage with us. At every stage of your journey, from your first day to this momentous occasion, they have been there to teach, to mentor, to guide you as you became the brilliant class before us. I know that they are all so proud of what you have accomplished and all that you will continue to accomplish. And I am most grateful to be given the opportunity to share a few words in front of such a promising class of graduates. It would be impossible to give this address without recognizing the crucible through which you all have passed. COVID-19 changed the course of your education and for many of you, your lives as well. Some of you likely lost friends or family. You saw firsthand what a real public health emergency looks like and how political polarization had a paralyzing effect on our ability to respond. Despite all the obstacles this period presented to your lives, let alone your education, you persisted. Despite the many ways our national response fell short, and despite all the vitriol and anger directed and misdirected at public health officials, you all believed that we could do better. You chose to answer the call and enter the field of public health at the most difficult moment in recent history, when we are struggling to answer the question of how to deliver public health services in an era of polarization. I cannot thank you enough for stepping up, and this nation owes you and all others who follow your footsteps a debt of gratitude. All of you made the choice to study public health for your own reasons, but I am confident that for many of you, that reason is the same one that drove me to seek elected office. You want to make our community stronger, improve their quality of life, and build a future that is better and better possibilities for all. And for me, making government work for people has always been at the core of my public service. I saw it first, firsthand from my parents, Ted and Louisa DeLauro, Italian immigrants in the Worcester Square community in New Haven, Connecticut. They both served on our community's Board of Alders. Growing up, 
Our kitchen table was like a community meeting table. I watched my parents work day and night to meet the needs of the people around them. Immigrants, like my parents, many of whom did not speak English. I shaped my priorities in the Congress, including fighting for equal pay for women, paid family and medical leave, affordable childcare, and universal health care. Thank you. And that was in the response to the needs that I saw in my own community. And it was not until later in life that I would learn firsthand just how much of a need it is to have a strong public health system working alongside our health, our health care system to save lives. How badly we lacked a national strategy for health policy and the inspiration that would give me to run for office. In 1986, when I was working as Chief of Staff to Senator Christopher Dodd of Connecticut, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I was fortunate to receive excellent health care, but I, when I looked back on that experience, it was the public health aspects of my care journey that likely saved my life and my ability to keep working for people. I received screening at a regular doctor's appointment that detected my cancer at an early stage, demonstrated the power of preventive screening and early intervention. Then Senator Dodd, who was the original author of the Family and Medical Leave Act, told me, go get well. And actually what he says, I will not start my campaign for re-election until you are well. With this assurance, I was able to focus on completing my treatment without worrying about my job. And the modern radiation treatments that I received were based on decades of scientific research led in part by the National Cancer Institute. I say as often as I can, and to anyone who will listen, I am here by the grace of God and biomedical research. Not only did these measures save my life, but they changed the course of my life. I decided to run for public office to have an impact on women's health, on poverty, and so much more. Like most of our society, our healthcare system works best for those already well off enough to take advantage of it. For those who are uninsured or chronically ill or unable to take the time off for treatment, a simple illness or injury can mean their lives quickly spiral out of control, saddling them with skyrocketing medical bills even as their health declines. And tragically, many Americans die each year from entirely preventable causes. And this, as you all know, is where public health is critical. Poverty, chronic stress, environmental conditions are real medical threats that exacerbate or directly cause many distinct ailments. These social determinants of health shape our lives in ever-present, often unnoticed ways, setting invisible limits on how healthy we can be and on the very quality of our lives. So many government policies, from labor laws to school lunch programs to tax policy, are fundamental inputs to public health. At the local, state, and federal levels, decisions are made every single day that end up driving health, public health outcomes, even if it is not obvious at first glance. A prime example of these policy drivers impacting health is the child tax credit, which I have been fortunate enough to champion for my entire career. And that's a lot of years, guys. This program was expanded and improved in 2021 as part of our pandemic response in the American Rescue Plan Act, and the results were astounding. Overnight, it reduced the number of children living in poverty by half. It reduced the number of children who were going hungry by a quarter. It was the largest tax cut for working and middle-class families in a generation and provided a lifeline to families dealing not only with a pandemic, but also with rising costs that were swamping their families' budgets. This was not an abstract achievement. 
It had a real impact on everyday lives and the health of children across America. Kids cannot play, they cannot learn or grow adequately when they are hungry. Poor nutrition. Poor nutrition can create a host of health problems later in life, from weakened immune systems to fragile bones and more. A child tax credit that helps families afford the food their children need to grow up strong and healthy can be just as much a part of public health success as a vaccination drive or a medical research breakthrough. And after my years of work, I've come to believe that improving public health is inseparable from improving the daily condition of people's lives. The same principle is present in environmental regulations that keep our air free from pollution, or building codes that ban hazardous construction materials. Some of the very first large-scale public health measures in our nation's history included the efforts by 19th and early 20th century progressive leaders to develop sewer infrastructure, limiting the ability for diseases to spread rapidly among populations. This is still important today. We need to do a much better job worldwide of infrastructure innovation and maintaining the basics. Sanitation systems, waste removal, clean water supply systems are vital to stopping the spread of disease worldwide. Unfortunately, we have underinvested in public health infrastructure for decades. And COVID-19 showed us just how unprepared we were for a fast-moving challenge at a national level. It is not the first pandemic that we have faced, and it certainly will not be the last. In fact, when we do not prior prioritize public health, the more likely it is that pandemics can start and spread before we can muster a response. And that is why, in my time as chair of the House Appropriations Subcommittee, that funds the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I recognize the critical importance of investing in core capabilities of public health to ensure that our budgets serve as a riding tide that lifts all boats and help everyone live healthier lives. This includes investing in modernizing and standardizing public health data, strengthening laboratory capacity, and probably most of all, increasing the public health workforce at the national, state, and local levels. If we are going to have the public health capacity we know that we need, it is imperative that we focus our efforts on building resilient and responsive agencies and programs with skilled and thoughtful leaders who can respond to both new and ongoing issues to keep Americans safe and healthy at home and abroad. We will need more measures like the Prevention and Public Health Fund in the Affordable Care Act, which has to date directed a record investment of over $12 billion to the Center for De Disease Control and Prevention for supporting local solutions to communities' most pressing health challenges. These have included supporting immunizations, preventing childhood-led poisoning, strengthening the public health infrastructure, and more. It can often be difficult to make the case in government for investments like this that pay off over decades rather than years. But make no mistake, that is what we must do. This mission is more urgent now than ever before. Climate change is impacting the nation and the world, bringing with it new health threats like extreme heat and increased air pollution. And that means increased levels of heart and lung disease, particularly in low-income communities, which are often the hardest hit, and they have the fewest resources. We are also facing slower moving, but still significant challenges from our aging population. Aging-related disease rates and the cost of elder care are rising. Additionally, while advancing technology and new fields like artificial intelligence and synthetic biology are bringing great advancements in health. And they also present new risks required, requiring enhanced security and procedures to keep dangerous infectious agents in safe and secure hands. And perhaps most alarmingly of all, public health 
has become politicized and polarized in a way that it has never seen before. At the height of a global pandemic, we had people in positions of power who were denying the importance of vaccines and preventative practices. We had leaders choosing inaction and an every person for themselves approach over acting on behalf of a broader community. And we are still seeing the impacts of this assault on the credibility of public health today. As vaccination rates for diseases like meals, measles has slipped and led to outbreaks that we thought were behind us. What this means is that while the number of public health challenges on the horizon are increasing, these are also not just individual policy problems that can be solved piecemeal. There is a broader society-wide gulf to bridge between policymakers, the media, and the public. We must restore the trust in science and in science-driven policy writ large. So my dear friends, no pressure. No pressure. I am being honest with you about the challenges we have faced because I believe you are more than up to the task. Meeting these challenges, the very focus of this extraordinary school of public health, its leaders and its students. You are the infusion of energy and ideas that we desperately need. And whether you are graduating with a bachelor's, master's, or a PhD, you have been preparing for this moment. You have studied the issues, you've argued the evidence, you've written all kinds of papers and theses about public health priorities that we should set as a nation, whether that is universal health coverage, pandemic preparedness, chronic disease prevention, or something else entirely. COVID-19 did not deter you, and I am confident that nothing else will either. As you are preparing to go forth, from the theoretical to the practical, the question for you now is not just what policies do we need, the next question is how do we get them? How do we translate our ideals into impact? That is a more pressing question now than ever, given today's polarized and political environment. I understand why you might look at the Congress right now and despair that any meaningful change is possible. But I promise there is more teamwork and compromise happening out there than the media and the 24-7 political noise machine would have you believe. Public health has the advantage of occupying the most common possible ground. Why? We all ha only have a brief time on this earth, and we all want ourselves and our loved ones to live the longest and the healthiest lives that we can. There is also a strong global consensus about what concrete steps we must take. They include training the next generation of public health leaders and creating an international network to build trust across political lines, bolstering, strengthening, and harmonizing surveillance and early warning and detection systems, decentralizing vaccine manufacturing and medical countermeasures to enable faster responses to global emergency. If I may then, I would offer just a few pieces of advice for how to capitalize on the common ground and the global vision. First, I learned something about bipartisanship from Senator Chris Dodd. He always gained Republican allies and passed historic legislation. He advised me to join a committee outside of my comfort zone to learn from people who had very different experiences. I joined and I eventually chaired the Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee. So I began touring farms and meatpacking plants with rural lawmakers and learning about the issues they were facing. In this process, I met unexpected friends like Jack Kingston, a Republican from Georgia. We did not agree on much, but we respected that we were both trying to help people in the best way we knew how. With allies across the aisle, I was able to build bipartisan support for priorities like nutrition assistance and global food provision. Today, one of my closest partners is Congressman Tom Cole, a Republican from Oklahoma. We have worked for years on the Appropriations Committee, which is at the heart of our nation's government. Every year, this committee decides how to spend the nearly $1.7 trillion federal budget. And for eight years, Congressman Cole and I have traded off 
as chair and ranking member of the Labor, Health and Human Services, and Education Subcommittee. In that time, we have come to trust and respect one another as leaders. And that respect has led to a partnership on issues that we both care about, like biomedical research. Together, we have managed to increase funding for the National Institutes of Health by 58%, helping support more life-saving research on diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's, and dementia. These stories of cooperation and collaboration rarely make the headlines. But make no mistake, they are how real, lasting change happens. Second, look for opportunities to get involved in your own community. Much public health activity, as you know, happens at the state and local levels and is led by appointed professionals along with interested citizens. There are advisory boards, tax, task forces, citizens, commissions everywhere in dire need of your energy and your expertise. We urgently need trained data scientists, experienced research, and public health-minded leaders to join state and local government as well as at the federal level. Advising decisions about resource allocation, identifying areas of strategic investment for the future to make sure we are not just talking about public health when we are already in the middle of a crisis. No matter what career you choose, the education you have gained here can serve you and your community for a lifetime. You have the knowledge that our leaders need to make informed decisions. Do not be ever afraid to use it. Finally, and this is the most important advice of all, when it comes to your core goals, the ones that matter most, that put your deepest principles into action, never give up and never take no for an answer. My mother gave me that advice when I was a child. I have been told for as long as I have been involved in public service, no, or not now, or we cannot ask for that much. So many times in my career, and every time, my response has been, why not? If you start by selling yourself short, you will never get ahead. Even if you do not end up getting everything you want, if you hold your ground on the things that matter most, you will usually wind up with more than when you started. Looking out at all of you, I've never been more confident in the future of public health in America. You are the graduates that a pandemic could not stop. You are the generation that knows what is at stake, and you are the leaders who are rising to this challenge. I am honored to join you in celebrating your accomplishments today, and I cannot wait to see what you do next. Congratulations and Godspeed. Rosa DeLaro, my friends. Rosa, that was extraordinary. And um, when we sat down among a group of us to talk about who we wanted as our commencement speaker, um, we wanted somebody who understood public health at its core. And we could not think of anybody more appropriate, um, more in tune with what drives public health than Rosa DeLaro. So Congresswoman DeLaro, thank you so much for that. <clears throat> Along the way, as we were preparing for Congresswoman DeLaro's uh, visit, we also discovered something actually I knew a little bit about, but um, really came to appreciate. There is a notion in Washington that you never say no or push back on Rosa DeLaro. And if you want to understand why, you should watch a video from last week where she read into the congressional record that New Haven is the pizza capital of America. A pizza, a pizza, a pizza. Sorry. Um, my, my, what I'm hearing is that there's been some pushback from some members of Congress from Chicago. But I think what I've heard from the Congresswoman is they don't even count. 
A few people in New York have tried to say that she's not quite right about this. I don't hear much traction on that argument either. No. So this is going in a very specific direction. Um, I do want to take one more moment um, to give out an award. This is the Public Health Champion Award. Um, we started this award uh, to honor someone we thought. Um, it's the highest award that the school gives, and we wanted to honor someone we thought embodied not just the vision and the values of public health, but the action of public health. Because there is a lot of vision, a lot of values, a lot of good intentions out there. But at the end of the day, it takes grit, hard work, not taking no for an answer, to cut childhood poverty in half within a year. That is an extraordinary accomplishment and just a list of one of the many things that Congresswoman DeLauro has, has not only championed, not only advocated for, but accomplished. Her role in almost every major public health accomplishment at the federal level over the last 10 years have ranged from large to very, very large to instrumental. She's been there on all of it, and so I am very honored today to give out our Public Health Champion Award to Rosa DeLauro. All right, now we move to the, not that this has not been fun, it's been very fun, but now we move to the part where we hand out degrees. Anybody excited about that? Yeah, I thought that might be of interest. All right, so uh, I'm gonna ask Joel to come on up, and I think uh, we are, I'm gonna stand over here and we'll get going. We will now present diplomas to students who have earned a Bachelor of Arts with a concentration in public health. Megan Renee Aho. Janelle Renee Barnett. Elena Jasmine Pelage Bates. Emma Marie Bayer. Eliana Ruth Bloomberg. Evelyn Gray Calhoun. Haley Yenhua Chen.
Jadis Taylor Chen. Jennifer Lily Chang. Angelina Jade Cho. Naomi Desalin. Imran Ali Duramsi. Mihir and Dixit. Claudia Emerson Dyer. Emily Lillian Fallhaber. Nina Grace Feinstein. Ava Glazier. Mia Fay Harris. Arenal Gerson Hout. Ramla Kalfani Zico Jones. Grace Louise Jordan. Joseph Benjamin Khan. Ellie Carniadakis. Sanjana Kanda. Evelyn Tulai. Annie Ling Xiaoliang. Zachary Ian Lin. Allison Liu. Olivia Catherine Mariotti. Rachel Lynn Mashik. Ariel Page Montague. Amanda Tuyet Page. Gorov Rator. Lydra Lynn Reeves.
Ethan Register. Ann Emily Rufiak. Ava Sherlock. Saren Shin. Daniela Siegel. Noah Sudier. Mahadevan Subramanian. Riley Lillian Sa. Zoe Adeyes Ihuoma Ubamaru. Jane Griffith Valiant. Olivia Rose Vavasor. Anne Wong. Chelsea Diatong Wang. Grace Inez Williams. Braden Joseph Wines. Jocelyn Ray Zai Yang. Jasper Ye. Sarah Albert Rosenberg. Constance Olivia Fernandez Marangian. We will now present diplomas to students who have earned a Bachelor of Science with a concentration in statistics. Camille Antonio Dasso. Neha Narayan. Carissa Elizabeth Young Ah Che. Morgan Cunningham. We invite the graduates who have earned a Master of Science in Biostatistics to please come to the stage. Tara Chandrasekhar Amrutor. Kevna Asigi. Himashri Chandru. Wan Yi Chen. Hannah Jones Eglinton. Amira Farah Fauzia. Victoria Moran Grace.
Tova Lilia Petronella Ibbotson. Ewen Liang. Jia Lin Lu. Destiny Rankins. Alitzel Serrano Laguna. Hai Yue Song. Zhan Zhou. We invite the graduates who have earned a Master of Science in Clinical and Translational Research to the stage. Yasin Abul. We invite the graduates who earned a doctoral degree in Behavioral and Social Health Sciences to the stage. William Washington Lodge II. We invite the graduates who earned a doctoral degree in biostatistics to the stage. Taylor Michelle Fortnum. We invite the graduates who earned a doctoral degree in epidemiology to the stage. Jorge Ricardo Ledesma. Shayla Lakia Nolan. Hannah Ostroff James. We invite the graduates who earned a doctoral degree in health services research to the stage. Emily Taylor O'Neill. Joe Brian Bernie Silva. We invite the graduates who have earned a Master of Public Health to the stage. Parisa Afsharian. Neelam Ahmed. Tyler Simone Alexander. Nelson Makohara Nangwe. Dominic Angelino. Leonardo Gabriel Ariola Carnicelli. Leah Iman Artis. Rehan Aslam. Shivani Ayala Somayajala. Taylor Joy Nicole Ball.
Zubair Shahid Bashir. Amira Lashan Battle. Kiana Beheshtian. Batul Behnam. Ariana Stephanie Buderba. Virginia Ann Kafferke. Yu Chan Cao. Olivia Jung Hyun Choi. Aram Chowdhury. Dave and Andrew Crossland. Catel Margita Dunkor. Catherine Ann Dowling. Emily Gloria Alenio. Joan Chepneno. Gabrielle Simone Evans. Owen Braden Fahey. Nargis Faizi. Hannah James Fernandez. Elvira Sophie Carmen Fleury. Alexis Jacqueline Friedman. Elizabeth C. Gledhill. Shanai Gokchebel. Faith H. Hardy. Elliot Eva Harrison Lee. Shaw Hubbard. Ji Yoon Huang. Corbin Renee Jackson. Nayeli Jimenez Alvarado. Rosemary Jimenez Medal. Asia Johnson. Cambridge Avis Jones. Alexa K. Golmina Khan. Sydney Ann Lasan. Olivia Camille Lewis. Daphne Lauren Lowe.
Masa Maleki. Callista Rosemary Manuza. Cecilia Maria Martin Garcia. Melanie Giselle Morales Aquino. Alexandria Tiara Morgan. Zersha Munir. Stephanie Cecilia Munthi. Samantha Parker. Danielle Charnice Perry. Julia Aaron Pierce. Giat Ramouche. Marina Rasputna. Tishara Reed. Gage Alexander Reitzel. Jaidelis M. Romero Ramos. Ashley Nicole Sanchez. Julia Ray Scheinbach. Jessica Sierra Spencer. Isabella Gamma Lima Steadley. Diane Sadie Curley Story. Cheyenne Dawn Thompson. Michael Jusfu Thompson. Tiara Sharice Thornton. Emily Allison Toma. Nadia N. Sato. Olivia Virginia Waldman. Eli Sherman Wasserman. Caroline Goodman Welch. Lovisa Werner. Zakaya Whitaker. Jeffrey White. Katie Marie Yetter.
Lin Chiang Zhang. Anna Maria Del Pilar Subin. Olufambi Iboda. We invite the graduates who have earned dual master's degrees in public health and public affairs to the stage. Kyler Groner. Hannah Reali. The class of 2024. All right, I'm going to make this brief. Huge thanks to the families and friends who have endured these people. Well done. Huge thanks to the faculty who have taught these extraordinary individuals, um, the staff for making all of this happen, my friend Wilmot James for an absolutely extraordinary introduction, and then the incomparable Rosa DeLauro for giving us inspiring remarks, reminding us that at the end of the day, it's the action that matters. Go out there, do good stuff, and keep in touch, people. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>